the dawn of pediatrics in his soft and humorous yet elegant way will enlighten us well i think uh, after what we saw uh, the presentation of how important is history and physical examination and how small little things make a lot of difference uh, i thought i would just talk about uh, just one skill that a clinician must develop and that is one of observation i just want to share how much can observation make us wiser and i will just take you through some of the common situations where just a mere observation can almost make a final diagnosis even if you did not know any history or even if you never touched a patient and i think uh, what was said just now was that just seeing is not exactly observing and i think when you learn to observe you are very keenly looking at some clues that come through for example uh, this is a child two six year old children presented with purpura now you knew that they had purpuric spots but just by looking at them from a distance if one was sick then you knew that he had a bone marrow disease or he may have a meningococcemia and if the other was comfortable you know he had an itp we are all taught as undergraduates that the examination starts just by first observation and looking at him whether he is comfortable or sick almost gives you a possibility of what he probably has look at these two children uh, who came uh, three of them came with edema one of them is acutely sick he is probably a capillary leak another is chronically sick he is probably a chronic liver disease and a third is very comfortable and happy he is a nephrotic syndrome how important it is just to see how the child looks at it. having said this let me take you to a specific situation where even again an observation can make a lot of importance and this kind of patients teach us how much we can observe and what all things we need to learn to observe this is a 6 month old child who was seen to be breathing fast now when you see a child breathing fast can you make a probable diagnosis just by looking at him what all do we want to observe we want to know whether he is well nourished if he is well nourished obviously he has very likely a recent acute illness you want to know whether he is very sick looking if he is not very sick looking then very likely he doesn't have an acute bacterial infection you want to know whether he has a chest retraction if he doesn't have a chest retraction it almost rules out a large airway disease or even for that matter a lung disease like a pneumonia who would have obviously some retraction if he's breathing fast so now he has a no sound while breathing he has no strider wheeze or grunt that almost rules out an upper airway lower large airway or a parenchymal disease this is just by observation if you therefore saw that he was well nourished he was not very sick so probably he didn't have an acute infection he did not have an airway problem larger airway he did not have a lung parenchyma airway so he had an acute bronchiolitis we are not here not to examine a patient we are not here to take a detailed history but we are just trying to say that if a good clinician does lot of experiments with his own skills he can just one do an experiment that you just take a history and give a diagnosis another one could be just observe and consider a diagnosis each one of these components of clinical examination has so much to offer that if we combine all that you can imagine how much more you can do much before you plan an investigatory test let's look at the next one another 6 month old is breathing fast now you have known what you want to observe in a child who is breathing fast he is malnourished which almost means that he has got a chronic progressive disease he is sick looking he could be having an acute bacterial infection or he is already in an organ failure he has chest retraction which is subcostal and intercostal so probably he has a severe disease involving the airway and a lung parenchyma and then therefore he has a chronic progressive lower respiratory tract disease with 
probably an acute infection. If you just knew this by observation, you were worried whether this child has a cystic fibrosis or an immune deficiency. Just by looking at the basic things. Let's see the next one. Another one who is breathing fast. Now this child is malnourished. So obviously he has a chronic progressive illness. He is not very sick looking. So probably he doesn't have an acute bacterial infection. He has no chest retraction. So that almost rules out an upper large airway, a lung parenchyma, etc. He has a deep rapid respiration without respiratory distress. So he has a sign acidosis. Now you know that he has a chronic progressive, non-infective acidosis at six months. You have diagnosed him as a renal tubular acidosis. In each case you knew what you are looking at. And in each case, you knew exactly what one investigation, if required, you would do, or one focused clinical examination maneuver that almost confirms what you just observed. Imagine we have not even had a history. Add a history to it, you would know almost everything. Look at this child. He was also breathing fast. Now, he was malnourished, so he had a chronic progressive disease. He was not sick looking, so probably he didn't have a bacterial infection. He had a subcostal and intercostal chest retraction. It almost meant that he had an airway and a lung parenchyma involvement. If that was so, then we knew that, look at the precordium, the precordium was pulsatile. What does the pulsations over the precordium mean? There is a, probably a volume overload. Look at this child who has got a respiratory problem. He's not very sick looking, but he's certainly having a chronic progressive disease. And he has got a precordial pulsation suggesting that, that is, there is a volume overload. You have diagnosed him as a left to right shunt with a pulmonary edema. And therefore, this is the way you can almost say that this is the child breathing first because of the heart disease. What have we added on this child? You also looked carefully at the precordium. You could have picked up a precordial bulge maybe, or you saw in this child a precordial pulsation, and you knew that a silent precordium in a heart disease as against a pulsatile precordium in a heart disease makes a lot of importance in just observing whether you're seeing a pulsation or otherwise. Let's see this child now. This child looks cyanotic. Can we make a diagnosis of a cyanotic heart disease? This six-month-old infant looks cyanotic. He was malnourished, so he probably had some chronic disease. He was not sick looking. So he didn't have an acute exacerbation of his problem or he didn't have an acute infection. He didn't have a chest retraction. So he didn't have a significant airway or a lung parenchyma. He had a silent precordium. So he had no volume overload. You had almost diagnosed him as a phallus just by looking at him again. Let's look at some other scenarios. We showed you how a child with a respiratory distress of varieties of condition. Almost everything that you saw normally in clinical practice, you could merely observe the way he was breathing and you could almost diagnose a respiratory disease, a cardiac disease, a child with a renal tubular acidosis. What more do you want in routine practice? I think if we master the most common condition that we just pick up, even by observation, then I think it's very, very important. I, I do this with passion on my rounds. I tell the residents once in the first five cases, just tell me the history and give me your diagnosis. Maybe in the next five cases, just observe and talk what you are observing. I think it's a good way of training as well as training yourself. And I know that some of them would come brilliantly with this. I, I would certainly say that this sensitizes people to observe. We knew as undergraduate that we had talked about taught how to inspect palpate percus, but inspection was different than observation. You know, inspectors of varieties of agencies which go around do not observe anything. So what is inspection? Observation is something much different as you put up so many things and each one had a different meaning. Let's see whether we can diagnose an abdominal distension by looking at it. Again, I'm not trying to say that you don't do anything else in clinical medicine. Here is just to convince you that each part of the clinical medicine has such a tremendous power that an observation has a very strong power of making a diagnosis.
and many times we don't use that. And I think that is what probably is the purpose of such presentation. This was four-year-old child came with abdominal distension. It looked like a generalized distension with fullness in the flanks. It almost means a probable ascites. He looked normal in nutrition, so which means that he has no chronic disease. He was not sick, so he didn't have an acute disease or infection. He had no edema, so he didn't have any localized pathology. Now look at this. He has an ascites, he's not sick, he has not a chronic problem as we see, he's got to good nutrition, he has no edema. That takes away almost your liver disease, cardiac disease, a kidney disease, they will all be sick when they have an ascites and you have no edema at all. What does this mean to you? This means it could be a butchari or it could be a big mesenteric cyst or it could be a nephrotic syndrome who is already treated where ascites is yet to disappear and the peripheral edema is gone. You could come so close to by just knowing that this is likely to be ascites and an ascites in a child who doesn't look to be sick who doesn't look to be malnourished, he's happy, normal, and you almost make a diagnosis. All that you needed was just to check for the liver. If the liver was large, it was probably a butchery. If there's a history of previous edema generalized, you knew it was a nephrotic syndrome, or otherwise it could have been a large cyst as well. Let's look at this other fellow. This is another four-year-old with abdominal distension. He has an upper abdominal distension clearly meaning that he has got an enlarged liver, maybe with or without splenomegaly. He was not sick, so he didn't have an acute illness. But his growth was poor, so he has got a chronic disease. So he has got a chronic disease with liver enlarged, may also be spleen. He has edema of it, so he has hypoproteinemia. He almost got a diagnosis. There's no jaundice, not a significant pallor. So there's no liver cell failure, nor any hematological disease. And therefore, he has got a compensated liver disease. Let's look at the other one. So we saw abdominal distension who had only a mesenteric cyst. We could kind of guess that this is not going to be a liver disease or a kidney disease. And we saw another child who obviously looked an enlarged liver and a chronically sick child, edema, so we knew that he had a chronic liver disease, but he didn't have jaundice. Uh, he, he was compensated liver disease. Let's see whether we can make out a diagnosis by observation of just a pale child. This is a two-year-old, looks very pale. His growth is normal. So he doesn't have a very progressive disease. He's not sick. So he doesn't have any organ dysfunction or an acute infection. He's very comfortable in spite of looking very sick. Uh, very pale. So he has got a chronic anemia. If he was looking very pale and he had an acute anemia, he would be certainly breathless or he would be even in shock. So this child has got a chronic compensated anemia because of that he's still comfortable. He doesn't have any abnormal facies. So he doesn't have a congenital hemolysis. He doesn't have abdominal distension. So he has no liver and spleen. Now you got so much that this was a severely pale child who had a chronic anemia, well compensated, his growth is fairly normal, and he has no liver and spleen. Now, if you look at a severe anemia without liver and spleen, you have two major groups. One is a deficiency anemia, and one may be a bone marrow aplasia. Bone marrow aplasia is sick. So this has to be a deficiency anemia. All that I want to know is that, does he have an iron deficiency or a B12 or a folate? Can I make that also? Yes, could be. There was no purpura, so the bone, no bone marrow disease was out. But he had a mild icterus. Now, when everything said that he had only a deficiency anemia, and I found a mild icterus, so I need not push myself into a hemolytic anemia just because there was an icterus, because I've already found that he has no reason to be having a, any congenital hemolytic anemia. Therefore, I need to find out whether a mild icterus can be even seen in deficiency anemia. And surely this is the B12 deficiency where occasionally you might have even a mild icterus, a mild jaundice, because of an ineffective erythropoiesis that takes place there. So the point I'm making is that 
even when there was a mild terrorist as observed you still did not get away from a previous conclusions that this looked like a deficient anemia and you did not just go by a hemolytic anemia because there is no chronic hemolytic anemia which has no liver and spleen let's look at this other child who is pale this child is malnourished so he has a chronic disease this child is sick looking so he has some serious disease this child has an upper abdominal distension so he is very likely a hepatomegaly with or without splenomegaly now this child is a sick child chronic progressive anemia and with hepatosplenomegaly he has a purpuric rash so we already know that he has an abdominal uh, hepatosplenomegaly and hepatosplenomegaly would mean that either he has a hemolytic anemia or he has a bone marrow infiltrative disease he has a purpuric skin rash he's serious he's sick looking he's malnourished obviously he's got a chronic bone marrow disease and he's got a bone marrow infiltrative disease and therefore he probably had any of the infiltration that we won't know what it is but we already seen how different types of children with pallor can be made out simply by observation lastly let's look at whether we can also guess what's the cause of delayed development in a child by mere observation this is a 2 year old child who looks developmentally delayed he said appear small so looks like that he had an early onset problem of a brain disease he had no abnormal physiognomy so he was not syndromic he didn't have a chromosomal anomaly he moved all his limbs so he had no paresis he was crossing his legs so he had a seizuring he was spastic a child who had some brain injury very early in life that's why he was developmentally delayed and he had spasticity he didn't have any cranial nerves that you can see you can really see many cranial nerves by just observation common cranial nerves are picked up if he's crying you need to see the seven you see his eye movements you know third fourth sixth there so common cranial nerves are already picked up and you see that he has no pooling of his saliva so you know that his basal cranial nerves are all right what more do you want in this child you almost got the whole motor system you got a cranial nerves they are all normal therefore this child has growth and nutrition is fair which means that this is not a progressive disease one time damage thereafter he remained reasonably static in his growth this meant that he had a spastic cp just by looking at him you know that very likely he had a spastic cp this was another child who was developmentally delayed he was not sick looking so he didn't have any active infection or a disease he was subnormal weight but near normal length what did that mean he probably had not a very chronic disease if the length looks all right i know my teacher could almost tell me the weight and length by looking at the child and he told me that you have seen thousands of children then your visual impression could even tell me close to few grams of weight and a few centimeters of length by looking at him and i'm sure that when we start looking at such thing so on my round if my resident gives you a totally wrong weight or height then i i know that i ask him to take it again because you have a visual impression of what length or what weight the child has and i think this was a child who probably had a recent illness a recent illness not very sick so his illness must have disappeared and his head looks large the most common cause of large head is hydrocephalus he does not move his left upper limb or lower limb he is hemiparetic what more do you want he has had a recent illness from which he seems to have recovered but he is left behind with a hydrocephalus and a left hemiparesis and a developmental delay obviously in our situation he has a tbm let's look at this one this child looks severely developmentally delayed he is wasted and stunted looks like a progressive disease unlike the previous one who had a static disease so this child has got a serious neurological progressive disease which has caused a severe developmental delay head appears normal which means that this developmental delay must have started 
somewhere later in infancy, but not right perinatally, or for that matter, antenatally. And therefore, this child must have born normally. And somewhere down the line in infancy, he picked up this kind of a disease, which is progressive. He has dystonic, <clears throat> anaspastic posture, which you can see simply by observation, which means that he has the pyramidal disease and he has also basal ganglia disease. Now imagine a progressive, severe neurological disease, pyramidal basal ganglia involvement, global developmental delay. Now you know that he has also hyperacusis because he suddenly startles with a noise. So you had already made a diagnosis of a neurodegenerative disorder. The point that I'm making is that if you go one step further neurodegenerative disorder and even put one more factor, onset of a disease, you almost can guess what type of a metabolic disorder it could be. For example, if the neuroregression starts way early at about two, three, four months of age, it's almost a West syndrome or an infantile spasm. Occasionally, it could be an infantile gauchos like a big liver and spleen. Many, many neurodegenerative disorders are between six months and 12 months, and you have many of them, like Sandoff and Crabbe's and so on and so forth. You have a neurodegeneration which starts after a year, somewhere year and two. It could be a red syndrome in a female or a Lace syndrome, mitochondrial encephalopathy. You might have neurodegeneration starting somewhere three, four years of age. You have an adrenoleukodystrophy. And you have a neurodegeneration starting at eight, 10 years of age. You have an SSPE. What more does an average clinician wants to know? He already knows even a probable cause of a neurodegenerative disease. Add one more factor at what age it started, and you almost get the whole story right. This was an eight-month-old child with a delayed milestone. When you saw him, he looked alert and responsive. So obviously he had a normal cognition. When you look at him, he was malnourished. So he has a chronic progressive disease with cognition maintained. So very likely, he doesn't have a global developmental delay, but he probably has just a motor delay. So this is the child with a motor delay and a normal cognition. He has a frog-like posture. So it's a severe hypotonia. He has a severe hypotonia with normal cognition, but he's getting malnourished, which means that the disease is progressive and probably his nutrition is not being kept up. You get the diagnosis now that he has a severe hypotonia with a normal cognition, and this hypotonia is in a small infant. It looks like progressive. That means it must have started very early in life or maybe even antenatally. And then you saw he had a paucity of limbs. That means he was sporadic. If you knew that, he had a low voice, he couldn't cry. That means he had even a respiratory muscle affection, so he had already seen his tongue fasciculation, so you knew that he has an SMA type one. Just by looking at him, you knew that this is what it is. I thought I just would share some of these observational points. And we saw a child of purpura, which we made up, we saw five, six different types of respiratory distress in small infants, which we could guess whether it was a respiratory, cardiac, or maybe a metabolic. We saw abdominal distension where there was a mesenteric cyst maybe, or another chronic compensatory liver disease. We saw children with pallor where we picked up a vitamin B12 deficiency and a bone marrow infiltrative disease just by observation. And we saw delayed development. We saw spastic CP. We saw neurodegenerative disorder. We saw spinal muscular atrophy. If you ask me as a general pediatrician, what more do I want to know in each topic? I must say that this is all that I wanted to learn by mere observation. And the whole purpose of this presentation was that when we talk about history, physical examination, everything is important. But even in isolation, it may be a good idea to practice isolation skills. I recall Dr. Udani asking me as a registrar just to look at the leg of the child and diagnose. I used to tell him as a registrar, sir, how, tell me what is wrong with this. I said, no, there is enough for you to see. All that he wanted me to see was there was erythema nodosum on the leg. And he wanted me to pick up that. And moment I picked up erythema nodosum, you know what were the probable causes of erythema nodosum. That kind of a thing.
He would just say that, examine the elbow only. Now, I didn't know what elbow. I, I tried movements, and then I did not palpate a supratrochial lymph nodes. That was a syphilis of olden days. I've gone through this kind of an observation. I thought that I would share this kind of a skill. It makes the uh, clinical medicine very enjoyable. When you look at this closely and you start making something out of it, I think you enjoy doing what you do. And I'm sure that this doesn't take time. When you practice, it becomes even a habit. And I'm sure this is worth doing. Thank you very much.